TLO, what's pop? That's my nose ring. It's inside out. That's tough. We are on kick, K I C kick.com. We are not live, but you can leave a like in the comment because this is. You can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Uh, let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Right above me, this is where you can catch any of the highlights from the live if you happen to miss one. Don't forget, we do got merch. Got mine on. You get me. We also got the Patreon. We post Monday through Friday. This is a list. You can pause, see what's on there. Top Boy starts Friday. Uh, don't forget, you can go to the description of this video to see anything that I mentioned. You know what I'm saying? Click the description. You know, more You know what I'm saying? 21 Minutes With. This is Lad Bible TV. Murder detective on hunting a psychopathic killer. Okay. Down for it. What you got, Lad Bible? He looked just like a detective. A retired detective. Alright, let's let's see. When did you join the police force? I joined the police in 1977. 21st of March 1977. It's a date ingrained in my mind. And I was a science technician, I was a senior technician in a school. That's a date ingrained in my mind. Where are you from? Ireland? Um, I was at the top of my game, age 22. And I joined the police for a challenge. I quickly recognised the CID, that's where I wanted to go, wanted to investigate crime. As I progressed, I started off as a, a constable, a uniformed constable, I then became a detective constable. I was a detective constable working as in the lower level as part of the team. Now, you know, it's not always when I retired as a senior up. investigating officer, it's not just about me as a senior detective, it's about the team. And I was part of that team lower down, so I understood the whole processes all the way through. And as I moved on in the rank, I became a senior investigating officer. As a detective inspector, a senior investigating officer, a detective chief inspector, more complex investigations, and then ultimately when I left the police, a detective superintendent, a senior officer dealing with very high profile, <laughs> complex investigations. Okay. But everything that you did- But you worked your way from the bottom up. You was in the trenches with at the, you know what I'm saying? You was handing out tickets and traffic at first. And you worked your hard work paid off. Okay. Deal with as a detective, you're dealing with housebreakings, you're dealing with robberies, burglaries, rapes, serious sexual crimes, murders, everything. And nowadays, you know, ultimately, uh, in my later years, I was dealing with terrorist acts, the Glasgow Airport. Glasgow Airport. Terrorist attack. So the variety in the police is unbelievable. Do you remember the most violent crime scene you've attended? Her name is Angela Thompson. I always remember the names of the victims. And it was a sunny afternoon. I was a detective inspector. We got a call to go to a place in a place called Irvine because there was a girl in the garden with no head. The boyfriend Ryan Fierney, who is now dead. He believed that she was having an affair with other men. And he cut her head off. You see what love will make you do, man? Like, you gotta be careful who you fall in love with. Because love can turn people into, into gruesome killers. Be careful. With a beer bottle and a clothes horse Wait, cut what? her head off with a beer bottle and a clothes horse a beer bottle and a what i can't get that i don't know what he's saying the second word but a beer bottle you cut somebody's you decapitated somebody with a beer bottle that's different and then ran away with the head this case didn't really make the media it made the local media that's a horrendous case a horrendous case and that's one that sticks in my mind but they all do when you attend something like that and, and witness someone in that kind of way, how does it make you feel? 
One thing that is, is, is talked about quite a lot in, in, in challenging roles like the police and the military uh, and, and medical people is, do they, do, do they become hardened to what they see? As far as I'm concerned, as a detective, I have never become hardened to what I see. Because uh, you're human and you can't detach yourself from the fact that you're looking at a person that's been killed violently by another human being. So it's very difficult. It's very difficult. I guess, I guess. But it also depends what type, what side of the fence you're on. You know what I'm saying? What side of crime you're on. You're an officer. You have to have a heart. You know what I'm saying? But I'm pretty sure the criminals that are doing it develop. Like they're called. Obviously, they become cold hearted or hardened. You're dealing with what you're what you're always thinking in the, in the challenging investigations, particularly the big complicated ones. You know where there's huge media pressure on on you as a senior investigating officer. You're thinking, have I made a mistake? Is there something else we can do? Can we do this again? Because you know that whatever you do, you make a decision. Police yeah, officer that interviews in the street there, a detective sergeant or whatever, but ultimately the SIO, senior investigating officer, makes a decision. You're making a split second decision. That can be tried and tested at court. People could be spending hours researching that decision that you made and say, why did you do that, Mr. Swindle? Why did you make that decision? And you keep records, policy files of it, things like that. But everything is so, so fast moving. There's a lot of emotions, a lot of pressure. But for me, I always look to myself as, take a step back and assess a calm, rational attitude. Is there a type of case or a case that sticks out with you that's had the biggest effect on you or particularly heartbreaking? I, I, I think probably one of the big ones, a personal and professional life-defining change for me was the murder of a Polish student, Angelica Kluk, in a church in Glasgow in September 2006 by an individual called Peter Tobin. I just lost thousands of... Oh, skip. Here we go. He remembered names and everything. I, I mean, I would expect you to. Angelica Kluke was a Polish student that came to Scotland to better her education oh, and Scotland. to make money okay. to send back to her family in Poland. Glasgow. She stayed in a church in Glasgow, St. Patrick's Church in Glasgow. She disappeared. She completely disappeared one day. It was been dealt with as a local, by the local uniform chief inspector, backed up by the local CID as a missing person inquiry. But that changed as the week went on because what the local chief inspector and the local CID established was that the last person she had been with was a person called Patrick McLaughlin, the handyman at the church. Patrick McLaughlin was in fact Peter Tobin, a missing sex offender. And oh. that is when I became involved. I was a senior investigating officer dealing with various types of complex inquiries. I never understand how people just switch their names and live with another identity. Like what goes all into that? Like how do people just be doing that? The way I'd be sounding, it'd be making it sound easy. And I get the call from the chief constable's office a Friday afternoon that this was now a high-risk missing person. Peter Tobin had raped and tried to kill two young girls in Havent near Portsmouth in the 1990s, early 90s. And he was sentenced to prison. That's why he was a sex offender. Right. But he was a registered sex offender and he'd gone off the radar. So we have a real concern. Missing sex offender, using a false name. Missing young woman. Where is she? Where is Peter Tobin? How did you know that Pat McLaughlin was Peter Tobin? How did you know that that right. was Peter Tobin using an alias? When Angelica Clu went missing, it was established that she had been with, the last person she had been with was the church handyman Oh, you probably seen a picture of him and noticed them. Patrick McLaughlin. And Patrick McLaughlin worked for a, a homeless charity called the Loaves and Fishes. He actually had a name tag, Patrick McLaughlin, 
what had happened was the police, the local police, when they were making investigations, had gone public and they put that picture out publicly. And people came forward to say, that's not Patrick McLaughlin, that is Peter Tobin. So we arranged for the church to be searched. The church had been searched before, but the dynamics and the categorization had changed. There was real concerns for Angelica Kluck. So the church was searched using a team of experts, POLSA, police search advisors, and found under the floor the body of a young woman. Oh. We couldn't say who that was at that time due to injuries. And the person that was vital to that was a person, Carol Rogers, who has appeared on Lad Bible before. And Carol was a scientist. And she told me, I think I remember do that. not move the victim body. And she explained why, because of the injuries and because of other body fluids, if the body was moved, it would mean that we could destroy evidence. So Carol said, okay, I'll go under there and take samples. Meanwhile, I'm dealing with the huge impact, the media, Sky TV, live stuff from the scene, and criticism by Angelica's family. Why didn't they find the body? Is that her body in there? We didn't know at that time. Y'all still got to do the forensics. So, they still got to do the forensics, get like DNA and things of that nature. The injuries were too catastrophic to just look and see, right? They had to really, 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 really find out. All credit to the scientists. And that, that is one thing that I have always said as I progress through the police. Trust your experts and trust your team. And Carol, she lay under the floor and she took samples from the body of a young woman. And with what she found and what other scientists found, we could piece together what happened to that young woman. It was only as a result of clothing Science and other is things crazy. and DNA ultimately that we identified that that woman under the floor was Angelica Kluke. Okay. Angelica Kluke had been battered over the head with a table leg. She. You know what's crazy? And he's targeting like foreign people, like people that come to the country to get a better education. Like they do, they be oblivious to certain things. Like same here, same thing in America. Like. They just be oblivious and they like befriend people like it's like nothing. Like they, I guess like in somewhere like Poland or, or somewhere wherever, like they don't really have crime, I guess. I don't know. I don't want to put, <laughs> I don't want to assume nothing, but like they just be overly friendly. Nobody's ever told them to like watch over your shoulder some people's intentions are what they really seem to be, or things of that nature, you know what I'm saying? You've been gagged and her wrists were bound with cable ties. She'd been stabbed and she'd been raped. And then she'd been dumped under the floor like a bag of rubbish, concealed underneath the church floor. Underneath the church floor, it sounds crazy. It's a lot of things that be going on in the church, man. It's tough. At this point, Peter Tobin becomes a suspect. How did it come to be that you arrested him for this crime? Well, there was various aspects about this investigation, but, you know, regarding evidence, regarding forensic evidence. But the big one, there was a manhunt. Peter Tobin's face was flashed all over. And National he ran. Team, and he was found in a hospital. Are there times... Where was he found? In a hospital? Forgot to put my ad block on, my bad. TV. And he was found in a hospital in London. He checked into a hospital in London in a false name. And someone recognised him. Like, you don't need an ID or nothing? <laughs> These people, this man didn't been Peter Tobin, the other name, now he's another name, like... And that is how we became involved. That's how we tracked him down. And of course, when we start looking at Tobin, I, I decided when I saw the injuries that he'd caused and the way he had concealed her body, he had stayed at the scene for a couple of days, probably hoping that she wouldn't be reported missing. And then something changed, the dynamics changed in it, and he left the scene. And I thought in my mind, this guy is 60. You don't get to 60 and it's the first time you've killed in that fashion. The sophisticated... Yeah, nah, he, I didn't know he was 60. He got big. He got... 60. The violence 
the crime scene management where he covered up things at the scene, he had moved a shed where it had taken place, he'd rebuilt a shed, all these things added up in my mind and I thought, he's done this before. And that's when I decided to look at it. He's either a genius or he had to have done it before, it was obvious. His life, because I believed he had killed other people. He was convicted of the murder of Angelica Kluke in May 2007. And after he was convicted, that is when we went public with Operation Anagram regarding other potential victims. We had been working in the background, but we couldn't go public before he was convicted of the murder of Angelica Kluke. There had been stuff with the case. Um, we identified a, that Tobin had been in Bathgate, a place near Edinburgh, in 1990, 1991. And it was the same time as a young woman, Vicky Hamilton, had gone missing. And the police, liaising with the police, the Edinburgh police that were dealing with that missing person, they conducted a full review. This man of that. lived a 60 year life of freedom just going around our, our word and peep women and then unaliving them for 60 of them. I'm, I'm pretty sure he didn't start when he was a baby, but like, like well, he could have been early 20s and started doing this. He was doing this a while and then just got better and better at it, like for lack of better word. That missing person. And as a result of that review, We've got forensic evidence that linked Tobin to the Vicky Hamilton case. And that also included uh, searches of the house where he stayed, where they found a dagger. The post of the search advisor teams found a dagger, and on that dagger was DNA. And there was a purse that was belonging to Vicky Hamilton. A uh, what? A oh, purse. I thought he said a pus. Had been found at a bus station in Edinburgh, and on that purse was DNA. And the DNA was Peter Tobin's son. They're just linking Peter to everything. But they had to really, really search, though. Like that, that's real detective work. There was further inquiries done in relation to throughout the UK, looking at Tobin's life, where he was, Timelining, looking at his whole life. We did it in Leisung. Every single head of CID what did he, look like? he was involved. And what they did was reviewed all our missing people. And one that came under the radar for us, Operation Anagram, was a missing girl, Dinah McNichol. She'd been at the Lip Hook Music Festival and she'd been hitching a lift with the guy she met that day. And when she was hitching a lift, they get picked up, they get a lift from a guy, a Scottish guy. The person, they'd stopped at a service station and the young guy that she was with had gone into the garage service station. And when the, he came back out, the car was gone. So Dinah was nowhere. Her money had been used, her card had been used along the route, along a particular route, and also in the town of Margate. And Margate is where Peter Tobin stayed at that same time, 1990, 1991. He stayed in... This should be... Like, I, I'm sorry, I would never in my life... I know, I know it's a different time, a different era, but I would never hitchhike no ride. I don't, I'd rather walk 40 miles along the highway than jump in somebody's car. Like, I'm not doing it. Basket? and he stayed in Margate at the same time. We had an arrangement between both houses. Inquiries then were made locally at that house he stayed at in Margate. And a witness was traced that spoke about Tobin. They'd called him Scottish Pete, nice Scottish Pete, digging a hole in the back garden. With the help of the, the, the head of CID there at that time, Tim Mills, the detective superintendent in Essex, because of Essex, she was from Essex, they conducted a search, a full excavation using forensic archaeologists and other search specialists. The first body that they found... The first? There was multiple? ...was actually that of Vicky Hamilton. 
and I get the phone call and I couldn't believe that. As soon as it was Dane I was expecting to be there, it was Vicky Hamilton. And then they continued excavating and found the body of Dinah McNichol, buried in the back garden in graves, prepared graves deeply down in polythene sheeting. He went an uh, extra mile. It was three separate court cases for... Now artificial... He said deep down with a cover of what? Poly what? Did you attack? Prepared graves deeply down in polythene sheeting. Polythene sheeting? It was three separate court cases for Peter Tobin. Did you attend court at any point? Peter Tobin was convicted May 2007 of the murder of Angelica Kluck. He was then convicted uh, after a trial in Dundee of the murder of Vicky Hamilton. And then at Chelmsford Court in Essex, the trial for Dynamite Nickel. I was at that court trial. I was sitting there watching, and they're watching Tobin, looking at me, looking at everyone, making notes, laughing, feigning illness. Absolutely horrendous. You get a full life tariff for that murder of Dynamite Nickel. He got a full life? Yeah, but to sit there and look at him and see his behaviour there. Wait, what is Absolutely horrendous. You get a full life tariff for that murder of Dynamite Nickel. He got a full yeah, life. But to sit there and look at him and see his behaviour there and his total contempt for victims. At 60, he was doing this. So, yeah, he was definitely psychopathic. Uh, he's just a horrible guy, a horrible, horrible individual that's in total denial of what he's done. Peter Tobin, is like many serial killers, is a controlling individual. He's a cunning individual. And he's a narcissist. He'll speak and he spoke in interviews. He spoke and spoke and spoke. And he spoke about his favourite subject, himself. It's like Ian Brady and all these other people, Ian Brady, the Moors murderer. It's about control. It's about speaking about themselves. And that's what it was with, with Tobin. He's in total denial of the Angelica Clute murder and then the other ones that we found, the other victims that we found. How do you deny it? They, the bodies is in your backyard. Like, what do you mean? I haven't dealt with people like Peter Tobin and other murderers. Do you believe evil exists? Yes. Absolutely. There's a big concept round about people that kill murderers. Is it nature, nurture, or born evil? There are people that are just born evil. But for me, it's very difficult as someone that has dealt with the victims, dealt with the victims' families and seen the killer, to actually mitigate some of the issues and say, it's a shame that person killed because of something that happened in their early childhood. There are progressive things that happen. People, something that maybe triggers it in their early days, but a lot of the killers are just evil. Do you think Peter Tobin was evil? Peter Tobin was evil. Peter Tobin has killed other people. We don't know who else he's killed. He's definitely killed other people. But the fact that he targets people that were vulnerable at that time. So I'm saying very vulnerable people. Hitchhikers, you know, obviously you're hitchhiking because you ain't got nobody to call for a ride, vulnerable. Somebody from Poland, there by herself, studying for school, vulnerable. Like. The fact that he can hang around religious establishments help in groups. The fact it was a very affable type. Yeah, I ain't even mentioned that. I forgot about that. He was at the church scouting. That is evil. Big guy. And the fact that he buries victims will probably never know who else is killed. But Tobin, for me, was evil. But all cases, killers, are potential to kill again. But there's yeah. different types of murders. There's different types of murders. And the serial killers, the high profile ones, they're cunning, controlling, they're conniving, charming, and they can be clever. And it's all about power and control. The people like Ian Brady and Myra Henley, Fred and Rosemary West, you've got these people at Tobin, you've got these people 
it's a challenge for them to see if they can get away with it. And they all show similar traits about power, the power of being able to take a life away, about throttling someone, binding them, watching them, the victim to the last breath, where they can take their ultimate fantasy that they've got is taking a life away. And there's right through them all, they're all different, but the element there is the power for them to be able to do it, and it's about control. And that is a feature in the serial killer types. But there's so many murders, so many different types of murders, sadly, so many different types of motives. Um, there could be the, the murder in, in the street, a street fight, gang fight, drunk, organised crime. There are all sorts of different types of murder investigations. Right. Peter Tobin passed away in October 2022. When you oh, heard that it. news, how did it make you feel? Peter Tobin was a person that feigned illness throughout his life. He checked into hospital in false names. At the trials, he feigned illness and said he was ill and he was taken away to disrupt the trial. And we kept getting information out there, you know, intelligence or media reporting that Tobin was dying. I never knew what to believe. And then in October... He was like the boy who cried wolf. But was the wolf in sheep's clothing... Uh, last year, I got the call that he was dying. And for me, that... Bro, live to be what, 80? That was a big, big thing to hear that, but more so for the families of the victims. He died taking secrets to the grave. Like Brady, like so many of these people, they took secrets to the grave. And I just... I, I always hoped that someday he might reveal what else he's done. I mean, Fred and Rosemary West, who killed unknown amount of people in, in, in um, Cromwell Street in Gloucestershire, Rosemary West is still living. I always hope maybe she'll do the right thing and say what she has done. But I've said it before, Brady, Tobin, and other killers, Sutcliffe, are dead. Secrets have taken, been taken to the grave. When you look back on your career, uh, in the police force. How does it make you feel? I look back at my time in the police and I think, I think about everything. And I think about how lucky I was to be involved in working in such complex investigations. And when I uh, left the police, I hate to use the word retired because, you know, still there's life after the police. I always say, when my phone rings in the middle of the night, it's something to do with the family member. Before, my phone would ring in the middle of the night and it would be, someone's been murdered, there's a dead body lying in the street. That is the life you lead in the police. Working 20 hours a day, sleeping in offices, all sorts of stuff. But I look back at it and I say, I'm proud of it's it. It's a high level detective police officer. Let's not get that confused with a beat cop. I did. TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notifications. That was interesting. I ain't even gonna lie. It's been a while since I watched something interesting on Lad Bible. But Lad Bible, man, you know, get it out there, man. Salute.